Hi. Yes. Oh, to you. Hi. How's your day? Pretty good. How's yours? I'm like, no, it's fine. It's fine. Hi. I'm going to go gallery view. Hello. Hello, everyone. Look at all those books. A lot of books. That's nice. There's more. Wow. <laughs> like a dream room. Wow. Hi, Natasha. Hi. How are you? I'm like still trying to find some other books because I felt like my, my one contribution to this is just to like, you know, have books here and then just like maneuver them around the screen be like, this is the correct book to read the situation. <laughs> I know. Yeah, you're like a library in your brain. If I was writing your character as an all in a book, which maybe I'll do, that's how you be described. <laughs> Pippa, I don't think is gonna join us. She's been having health problems as a seventy-eight. Is she seventy-eight? Yeah. Yeah, seventy-eight year old artist in Long Beach. So we may or may not be graced with her presence. And Suzanne has laryngitis. She's our energy orgasm instructor. And <laughs> what's that? I wanted to hear about that. I know she's gonna, when she is better, we're going to do a follow-up. And Victoria, who will be present, is her housemate. And she has some videos of her so we can like get a sense of who she is. Hi, Mara. How are you? I'm okay. How are you? Okay. My sink is um, broken, so I might be like leaving intermittently. Your what's broken? My my hot water like is coming out of the faucet. Like, oh, uh, it's dramatic. Stupid. Yeah. While we're waiting for everybody to join, if people want to say their name and where they're tuning in from, if it's not a secret, I'm in up in Manhattan, surrounded by uh, hospitals and Sotheby's. Uh, I'm in Brooklyn, Jameson Webster, not surrounded by hospitals or Sotheby's. Hi, I'm Natasha, I'm from Toronto, and I'm not surrounded by hospitals, but I do live right next to the train tracks. And it's, it's very relaxing, actually. By Casa Loma, which when you look at the, the new Drake video, it looks like he lives in Casa Loma. It's, just like, <laughs> <laughs> it's this icon in Toronto that my mom also lives near, and so does Natasha. What about Michael? Uh, I'm Michael, and I'm in Iowa City. Oh, cool. Where it's, uh, where it's very quiet, despite the hospitals. Yes, Suzanne. It's, it's oh, maybe a little louder than normal. Oh, there's Suzanne. Oh, let's look at it. What does your background say? <laughs> 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 no longer. <laughs> How are you, Michaela? I'm. I am how I am. <laughs> every day, every hour is new. How's everyone? Okay. It feels like Sunday. Hmm. I have a related story while we wait. Yeah, please. And it's also about a housemate that is not home right now. So maybe I can tell the story before he arrives. He met a girl on one of those dating apps. I can't remember the name. And they've been talking for a month. And he's really into her. And now he's going to move into her place for a week. And then they're going to go to a cabin for two weeks. They never kissed. <laughs> they don't know each other. Oh, wow. And they're, um, I checked today, their signs are extremely incompatible. 
Uh, I'm very scared about this thing. I don't want to uh, disencourage him too much, but because of the quarantine and stuff, he at least has to be with her for two weeks. He can't go for a weekend and see if it's like they like each other. So they've been going on dates where they stand really far from each other or listen to music or something. Um, they're really into each other, but they've never been in normal circumstances. <laughs> Um now they're gonna move in together for they're so de they're so horny because that's the problem is horniness it's not even so they're so horny that they were gonna move into a cabin in in a week that from now but they're gonna change that and do it sooner so they're gonna spend three weeks together isn't that like a horror movie that might be just what it's supposed to be though no <laughs> And then it's over and then it's, the, you know, then you learn something from that. I don't know. Yeah, I mean, I'm like, go for it, you know, go for it. Um, I was more like, go for it for two weeks. They go for it for three weeks. Three That's weeks. like almost a full menstrual cycle. That could be like a whole thing. So maybe a whole cycle is better. So he sees like a whole, the whole range. Is it a big house? It's a cabin in West Virginia. <laughs> Romance. Okay, Reba's running late. She's on the phone with her grand, but we can start without her. And Andrew, I'm not sure. <laughs> Maybe I'll start by, let's see, I made notes, host notes. Intro Pillow Talk. Okay, Pillow Talk is the squishy spinoff of Hard to Read. It was launched in 2018, and I think we've done like 20 or so, 20 plus events at this point and it's somewhere between like a think tank and a panel discussion and group therapy although not promising any cures or real help necessarily I guess peer-to-peer -peer level therapy if anything and consciousness grazing groups I don't know taking cues from different things the idea was to have an alternative to the internet forum to communally talk about things that felt pressing now we're back online which is a weird switch but that's fine that's where we are um, and then the think tanks are an idea to pace us in the lead up to being back in the world and <clears throat> some of them are designed to be more uh, diversions or entertaining stimulating and some of them are more applicable or like activist oriented I guess um, in terms of knowledge sharing that can be instrumentalized in like your social political personal lives and today's topic is loosely titled life and death and horniness crisis is aphrodisiac this event will ask and answer questions like how are violence slash pain slash crisis slash threat slash thanatos slash death I mean, you can decide which one of those you want to focus on or if they're all the same or different. And arrows, sex, pleasure, slash desire intertwined beyond this moment and in it. How do we see um, Thanatos and Eros activated in our political systems, our media, our professional and or personal lives? How are desire and seduction associated with conquering and or submitting to the inaccessible, the other? Uh, there's like this idea put forward by first Ryan Eisler and then picked up by feminist bell hooks and Starhawk about the dominator partnership culture continuum, the dominator culture being often the culture that we're living in, although subcultures can practice partnership ethoses, dominator culture thinking like one over the other, I guess zero sum games and uh, kind of binary minded and aggressive, whereas partnership culture being oriented around recognizing um, mutual interest, symbiosis, mm, yeah, mutuality of various sorts and working with one another's strengths to affect greater good or lives or something. Um, so thinking of that in terms of sexuality is interesting to me because so many kinks are seen more rooted in dominator culture. And so then I was interested in hearing from someone like Suzanne Sutton, who's present, um, about what spiritual sex and mystic sex might be, energy orgasms, experiences of sexuality I've had that seem abstracted from self versus other kind of power play, and that often are like a higher form of pleasure, but are tricky to access. Yeah, what are energy orgasms? What's spiritual? Mystical sex. What do the aforementioned questions have to do with power? This is a big question for Pillow Talk repeatedly over the last little while. What are different forms of power? How can we give of power different of domination? Maybe it'll be relevant 
talk about what modes of erotics have bad come downs versus ones that have sustainable energy, autoeroticism, quarantine fantasies. You know, we'll let it devolve or expand however it needs to with the like first questions of how are life and death and horniness and crises like these, how are they interacting currently and in our culture at large? We can start with Jameson. Okay. <laughs> Hi, everyone. I'm Jameson. I had said earlier, I'm in Brooklyn. I'm a psychoanalyst. Um, I, I'm actually working in the hospital with uh, palliative care out in Mount Sinai in Coney Island. Um, and yesterday was my second day. And then last night I had this completely erotic dream. Now, I don't know whether it's because this, <laughs> this event was taking place today or whether it was having been around um, so much death, but uh, a couple of things came to mind, psychoanalytically speaking. Um, one, I recently taught Freud's article, Morning and Melancholia, to my students. And one of the things that Freud references is that in kind of whatever more sort of earlier cultures, it was like well known that a woman would become like in the face of loss, sometimes incredibly um, sexual. And that they used to have rituals where they would make a woman, if she lost her significant other, um, immediately have sex with someone. And they don't know why they did that, but the, often the idea was that you had to get the sperm out of her so that she's not possessed by the person who she lost. So there's this very, very tight connection between sex and death that Freud always wanted to kind of go back to. And the idea that all desire comes from the sort of loss of an object, that you're always searching in your desire for something that's um, lost. And that it's always present in every act of desire is um, I think sort of fundamental. So you would think that in times of crises, we'd be very close to this. So. In thinking about these, I, I do have two videos. I don't know if we just want to jump to them. Yeah. To set the stage, the idea I was thinking of is this relationship between um, death and sex or sex and loss or mourning and melancholia and sexuality. I wrote about this in my first book, but this video just sort of blew my mind. So this is what happens with lions. Oftentimes when the head lion in a pride uh, is starting to kind of lose his virility, the new lions start swarming and figuring out if they can take over the pride. And this is what happens. Yeah. Awesome. Can you see? Mm -hmm. Yeah. ...challenged by younger males, like these. As time passes, the threats become more serious. The prospect of the battle, the females and cubs make themselves scarce. The residents are defiant, so a demonstration of male power is inevitable. After their brutal mauling, the overthrown brothers withdraw. After several years in charge, like, 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 I haven't had that much orange juice in years. The interests of the new males and those of the lionesses differ. Without their fathers to protect them, mm. trigger warning territory. Systematically hunted down and dispatched. <laughs> The lionesses have no defense against the male's superior strength. For the mother, a year's parental effort is wasted. But for the males, the loss of the cubs is in their interest. It causes the bereft lionesses quickly to come into season. However, the lionesses need a strong coalition of males for their future protection, so they must prevent them fighting over sex. They do this by being sexually insatiable. As each lioness comes into heat, she demands to be mated every 20 minutes. Over three days, a lioness can copulate 300 times. When one male has had enough, 
she allows the other to take over, keeping them both happy. So that was the, this idea of <laughs> this sort of incredible primal scene that's always on the sort of background of the destruction of an entire generation. Mm -hmm. um, and we're certainly in this moment in this quarantine with a real question about what's being destroyed in our society, what's being reborn, can anything be reborn? Um, are the kinds of cracks that are showing up in our world going to make us change anything? Um, if nothing changes, how utterly melancholic are we all going to feel at the end of all of this? And there's something just very primal sceny about the moment, which has this quality of sex and death and life and rebirth. And when I wrote about this, like a, in my first book, which was like a million years ago, it was like 2008. I had this, I just had this feeling that this, it was a scene like this, like a kind of primal scene like this that psychoanalysis was always going back to. It was always going back to as if at the minute that you have to understand your own origins, that you have to understand what was destroyed in order for you to come into existence. And so there's always this quality of imagining a new life and then the old life that kind of disappears in the creation of the new life. And so I think this is why crisis is an aphrodisiac. Mm -mm -mm. We are welcoming Andrew Blackley, who's also a psychoanalytic student. He's no, I'm I'm just I'm just art adjacent. Art adjacent. Not true, Andrew. I'm psychoanalysis adjacent. <laughs> hey, hey, I'm sorry. I thought this was three thirty. Am I am I late? No worries. <laughs> tell us about tell us about Eros and Thanatos. I think you might be able to better, but. I, I think everything's just a little reversed right now and a little kind of gray, vague mess right now. What do you guys think? It feels like purgatory. Mm. Yeah. A little bit, like in the sense that you're neither here nor there. Like you're neither like in hell or you're neither in heaven either, but you're just kind of in this like state of waiting and your soul is kind of being purged eventually so that you can go to heaven. This isn't like Catholicism, but it, but it is... I feel like it's more the state of suspended animation unless you're kind of in a position to either capitalize on like the fun the financial destruction that's going on already or you're either on the my life is going to be completely and totally destroyed by that but for the most part in either one of those positions you're kind of in the state of like perpetual waiting which where were you before how did you experience it before this distinction came um before quarantine uh, yeah before purgatory well i mean before purgatory you're alive really but um it depends on whether you kind of consider um the life that you were leading before this state to be like truly alive or mm. not i think the limbo or purgatory feels accurate for a moment initially when mara who stepped away maybe to deal with her hot sink and I were initially talking about this as a topic, it was the first couple weeks of, even at that point, almost voluntary quarantine for us. Yeah. And I felt a lot of sexual charge and alertness. And the longer I'm in it, the like greater the dulling of the senses. I'm wondering if people have a similar reaction um, and they could speak personally or more abstractly. I mean, if you're closer to the trauma, I think you feel more alive. There is something about being caught at a distance from it. I'm actually really grateful to be able to go to the hospital. I would, I would go crazy. I think being so far away from the thing that you're watching happen around you through the news. Yeah, it creates a sense of impotence, which I already feel whenever I read the news and I'm frustrated by our political social systems where you're so far away from a power being able to execute any power over it. More welcoming Reba also. Hi. How are you? I'm good, I'm sorry I'm late. I was on the phone to my gran. She's That's by herself, so I have to, you know, make sure I uh, have a long conversation with her every day and I didn't want to rush getting off the phone to her, you know? No, it's good. Thanks, thanks for having me, it's good to see everyone. It's nice to see you. Um, maybe, Initially, I just prompted um, Jameson with asking 
how from her professional opinion she's seeing um, violence and threat and death and sex and desire intertwine in this moment and beyond. I was wondering if Reba and Andrew have opinions on that or maybe we can even move on. I was thinking that Thanatos and Eros activated in political systems and media and professional lives was particularly relevant to Reba. Mm. But maybe Andrew first since he's well, psychoanalytic adjacent. We'll stay there. Uh, I'm, I'm also art adjacent, as I said. And, you know, this morning I was thinking, I went on a walk this morning and um, it, was, it was at like a waterfront kind of near where I live. And I saw this like rope that reminded me of um, this artwork that my, I used to work with this artist named Lutz Bacher. And anyway, I just was reminded of a sculpture that she made. You know, we were in her apartment, like, um, I don't know, five years ago now. And Lutz was talking about this series that she did called Sex with Strangers and from 1986. She reminded me that a, I don't know if it was a, a biologist or a medical doctor or whatever, but that somebody along the way had reminded her or told her that that sex is not safe and that sex is um, never safe and that, you know, human contact or like interpersonal contact is always less san sanitary than people kind of imagine. You know, I was kind of giving some thought to that earlier today and kind of in light of kind of what we're talking about here or how I was kind of prompting myself. But, you know, I kind of wonder about this kind of moment when we are told that, you know, even just like speaking to one another is, I mean, speech is like one of the three kind of carrier uh, processes like of um, the coronavirus, other being like sneezing and coughing. And those aren't kind of like inherently kind of sexual, you know, you can have sex without sneezing or coughing or, or speaking. So we have this kind of like sexual injunction or the kind of this like ask to like not congregate, you know, with strangers or with groups of strangers. And I wonder kind of what this censorship is, uh, kind of consequences of that. Um, you think over the long haul that we're going to have some strange associations to contact? Um, I think so, yeah. And I think that people will be at once skittish and kind of thrilled by the idea of, of even kind of everyday, I think it's going to produce like a re kind of eroticization of everyday contact, assuming that we can get through this kind of waiting or purgatory period and um, get to the other side of it. Can kinks be created later or are they like very much embedded in childhood? You mean like, could this give birth to all kinds of new kinks? kinks even though we're adults? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, they're, they're all variant variations of one another. It's like a little process of iteration. So maybe we'll have new Corona. But it's like new fantasies, isn't it? You can always have new fantasies that are always being created. When this first started, and I started to realize that quarantine was going to be this reality, I just thought, well, there's going to be two new big fascinations in people's sexuality. It's going to be mind games, and it's going to be bukkake. You know, it's going to be the two extremes of like absolutely no physical touch whatsoever, and absolute just, you know, covering someone in ejaculate. And um, I still think if we, if we, I haven't actually done it, but it would be interesting to see how Pornhub's searches have changed in the last month. But I do think there's going to be a lot more um, in the extreme where, you know, the middle ground of just kind of missionary position won't be as exciting because people are going to be left with their imagination so much more. I found like the, because I'm listening to my patients, the ones who are alone are the happiest. <laughs> I mean that, I mean, in the sense that they are, they're like finding something in their solitude um, and their solitude is simply a fact because they ended up, whatever, when this happened, being alone. And the people who um, are living with their families or, or partners are having a really, really hard time. Mm. Yeah, the close quarters is hard. Alana, have you, you've been like, you've set, you and your partner have set up, um, goals is that kosher to talk about could you tell us about the goals that are helping <laughs> well i was very stoked last week <laughs> and horny and 
I mean, the whole thing for me has definitely been having a negative impact on my sex drive. I should clarify that I'm married, living with my partner. Yeah, just really going deep into depression and anxiety and everything. And one thing that always makes me feel better is having sex. So I was like, let's have sex for 100 days in a row and see what happens. <laughs> let's just do it. So today's day eight. We're going strong. I, I think it ends July 19th around there. And it's helping. Do you set an alarm? How do you like... Make, meet the deadline. Uh, we don't do it at any certain time during the day. Um, so when I was thinking about this, um, I weirdly thought le- there were two ways that I kind of went with it. Um, the first was more like mysticism, like female mystics, like saints. Like there was this one, um, Angela Foligno, um, who famously um had this experience where it's sort of like she was kind of like drawn in it had this experience of god and then um she just started screaming in church and for a while they thought she was like possessed and shit but then they're like oh no actually this was not the work of the devil um but the reason that she was like screaming was it was sort of like the retreat like god's away from her and like the divine um and then the other one was weirdly greek tragedy (laughs) more specifically kind of um things like the bacchae where basically pentheus uh when he's like oh i'm not gonna recognize dionysus what the fuck like basically he ends up dressing up as a woman to see like where everyone's going and then basically his, his own mother i believe um, and, like, the women who are, like, these maenads end up tearing him to pieces, limb from limb. And even in his name, like, Pentheus, it's, like, Man of Sorrows. So, Bacchae. Uh, this one, Grief Lessons. This one I was digging into. It is The Mirror of Simple Souls by Marguerite Pratt. And she's kind of more in the Christian mystic Spain. And she's kind of basically talking about how, like, the soul kind of comes into union with God and whatnot. She wrote this book and then she was burned at the stake for heresy. And then later on, people were like, no, this is actually a very good and sainted book. (laughs) Um, Reba, what have you been up to? I I was supposed to be on a residency right now um, in Tbilisi and I had to leave because I was worried about borders and flights. So I've just kind of been carrying on with the work that I would have been doing if I was in the residency. So I feel very lucky. And I'd already sublet my apartment in London. So financially, I haven't been too fucked over, even though, I mean, I lost a lot of work like everyone else. So I've come back to my mum's, which is very strange because I haven't lived with her since I was a teenager. But actually, it's been amazing. Her apartment's tiny, but my sister's here as well. And I weirdly feel the most relaxed I have done in a long time. And I think it's because it's the first time in over 10 years I haven't been paying rent. And it just made me realize the immense stress we all exist under all the time. And now I've had this two month momentary break from paying rent. Just the space that my brain's been able to have from that is completely insane. So I've been doing a lot of writing, trying to write like a, a kind of substantial new piece. And I've been editing some films and, uh just spending some time with my family so it's good what are you writing about are you allowed to tell us yeah i've got um i don't know what what format it's going to take initially i thought it was going to be a play i think maybe now just elements of it might might be like that but i'm writing about um i had this experience with this submissive last year who made some work for me for a show that i had last year it's a very kind of long convoluted story and it's taken me this long just to have the kind of headspace to be able to see it more clearly because it was very emotionally draining um, and confusing. So I'm now writing this piece about this submissive who was alt-right, not an incel necessarily, but someone who really liked Jordan Peterson. He was also an A&E doctor. So he had this strong conceptualization of himself as like a good, a good person. And his meeting with me obviously challenged what he believed his core values were. What was the nature of the work that he did with or for you? 
Oh, well, I'm a dominatrix and I, um, I make my, I also have a, an art practice and I get my submissives to make my work for me because my whole thing is that the what submissives can never... Like what, what did it, what form did it take? The work that he made for me. I got medium. Oh, so there was, um... <laughs> what, like, how would you describe, like, just would you describe it or, you know, describe, like, the way in which he, um, he worked, you know, with you or for you? He... This is, this is where it gets more convoluted, but I was in a right-wing media storm about 18 months ago and it went completely viral and the headline was something like political dominatrix turns white right-wing men into socialists. And then, you know, it went all over the world and the incels got on it, Reddit got on it, it, it got pretty nasty. And I received a lot of hate mail and threats and abuse. So what I did with my submissives is I printed out a selection of the abuse and I made them use the cut-up method and make love poetry about me from this abuse. Because I said, if you really love women and you're telling me you have a fetish for female supremacy, you have to prove it to me and you have to look at what you did, uh, what's happened to me. And you have to look at this reality of a certain aspect of male culture that exists. So, something you just said reminded me, like I, I had a friend a couple of years ago who was making a movie, uh, nothing kind of explicitly sexual and, and I featured, you know, heavily in it. And I, and I loved the kind of thrill and the flattery of being recorded. But when he started to edit the film, um, something I came to realize about myself is that I quite liked the idea of being recorded, but really hated the idea of being kind of shown. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, a lot of this submissive fear came from him being obsessed with being a doctor and what that gave him and his integrity that he uh, believed it gave him and how him being outed as having a fetish could possibly ruin that. But, you know, I never knew his name. All I knew was his first name. I never knew where he lived, where he worked, but he'd been to my apartment. He knew my full name. But, you know, I feel quite bad because he's probably working very hard in the hospital right now. Yeah. Even if he does love Jordan Peterson, you can't have it. <laughs> Someone who loves Jordan Peterson could save your life. You never know. Sure. <laughs> Jordan Peterson's in Toronto. Do you think his upset has to do with um, the the value of your art and both it existing in a market or it being important to you or important to other people? I've had other submissives who've had issues with that, but he's never had an issue with that. For him, it was purely about this conceptualization of himself as a good person. The doctor is a funny character because doctors have to do something slightly perverse all the time, which is to treat patients as if they're not human beings. Yeah. I mean, in order to do what they have to do. So there's something fetishistic already in being a doctor. And I, having spent time in the hospital, forgot how dark the humor is in hospitals. I mean, it gets, yeah. it gets pretty dark in there. I mean, they were, you know, kind of making bets on who was going to go in the ICU over the next night. And, and you don't fault them, you know, and then they sort of reel themselves back. But I mean, that's the, that's hospital life. That has to be humor in it. He was and then, which is funny because then there's the moralistic, like, we are the good people, we are the heroes, we are the savers. Well, Michaela has some stuff prepared that we want to get through and then we can sort of like let loose for the last little bit. Are you ready? Mm-hmm. Ooh. Ooh. I was Hamlet. I stood at the shore and talked with the surf. Blah, blah. The ruins of Europe and back of me. The bells tolled the state funeral. Murderer and widow a couple. The counselor is goose-stepping behind the high-ranking carcass's coffin, bawling with badly paid grief. Who is the corpse in the hearse about whom there's such a hue and cry? Tis the corpse of a great giver of alms. Elaine formed by the populace. Creation of his statecraft. He was a man. He took them all for all. I stopped the funeral procession. I cried open the coffin with my sword. The blade broke its head. With the blunt reminder, I succeeded. And I dispensed my dead procreator. Flesh likes to keep the company of flesh among the bums around me. 
Good morning, turned into rejoicing. The rejoicing into lip smacking on top of the empty coffin the murderer humped at the window. Let me help you up, Uncle. Open your legs, Mama. I lay down on the ground and listened to the world doing its turns and stepped to the kitchen. I'm good Hamlet. Give me a cause for grief. Ah, uh, the whole globe for a real sorrow. Richard the Third, I, the prince killing king. Oh, my people, what have I done unto thee? I'm lugging my overweight brain like a hunchback. Clown number two in the spring of communism. Something is rotten in this age of hope. Let's delve in earth and blow her at the moon. Here comes the ghost who made me. The axe still in his skull. Keep your hat on. I know you've got one hole too many. I would my mother had one less when you were still a flesh. I would have been spared myself. Women should be sewed up. A world without mothers. We could butcher each other in peace and quiet. And with some confidence. If life gets too long for us or our throats too tight for our screams. What do you want of me? Is one state funeral not enough for you, old sponger? Is there no blood on your shoes? What's your corpse to me? Be glad the handle is sticking out. Maybe you'll go to heaven. What are you waiting for? All the cops have been butchered. Tomorrow morning has been cancelled. Shall I, as is the custom, stick a piece of iron onto the nearest flesh or the second best to latch onto it since the world is spinning? Lord, break my neck while I'm falling from an alehouse bench. Then just Horatio, confidant of my thoughts so full of blood since the morning is curtained by the empty sky. You'll be too late, my friend, for your paycheck. No part for you in this, my tragedy. Horatio, do you know me? Are you my friend, Horatio? If you know me, how can you be my friend? Do you want to play Polonius, who wants to sleep with his daughter, the delightful Ophelia? Here she enters right on cue. Look how she shakes her ass. A tragic character. Horatio Polonius. I'm playing Hamlet. Denmark is a prison. A wall is growing between the two of us. Look what's growing from that wall. Exit, Polonius. My mother, the bride. Her breasts, a rose bed. Her womb, the snake pit. Have you forgotten your lines? Mama, I'll prompt you. Wash the murder off your face, my prince, and offer the new Denmark your glad eye. I'll change you back into a virgin mother, so your king will have a blood wedding. A mother's womb is not a one-way street. Now, I tie your hands on your back with your bridal veils. I'm sick of your embrace. Now, I tear the wedding dress. Now, I smear the shreds of the wedding dress with the dust my father turned into, and with the soiled shreds, your face your belly, your breasts. Now, I take you, good morning. In his, my father's invisible tracks, I stifle your scream with my lips. Do you recognize the fruit of your womb? Now go to your wedding, whore, and the broad Danish sunlight shines on the living and the dead. I want to cram the corpse down the vitrine so the palace will choke in royal shit. Then let me eat your heart, Ophelia. Which weeps my tears. I am Ophelia, the one the river didn't keep, the woman dangling from the rope, the woman with her arteries cut open, the woman with the overdose, the woman with her head in a gas stove. Yesterday I stopped telling myself. I'm alone with my breasts, my thighs, my womb. I smash the tools of my captivity, the chair, the table, the bed. I destroy the battlefield that was my home. I fling open the doors so the wind gets in and the scream of the world. I smash the window. With my bleeding hands, I tear the photos of the men I loved and who used me on the bed, on the table, on the chair, on the ground. I set fire to my prison. I throw my clothes into the fire. I wretch the clock that was my heart out of my breast. I walk into the street, clothed in my blood. You want to eat my heart, Emily? <laughs> I want to be a woman. What if I kill the child of love? The stone is smoking in quarrels from October. A bad cold he had of it, just the worst time. Just the worst time of the year for a revolution. Cement in gloom walks through the slums. Dr. Zhivago weeps for his woes. Sometimes in winter they came into the village and tore apart a peasant. I'm not Hamlet. I don't take part anymore. My words have nothing to tell me anymore. My thoughts suck the blood out of the images. My drama doesn't happen anymore. 
I mean, a set is put up by people who aren't interested in any drama for people to whom it means nothing. I'm not interested in it anymore. I don't play along anymore. The set is a monument. It presents a man who made history, enlarged a hundred times. The petrification of a hope. The name is interchangeable. The hope has not been fulfilled. The monument is toppled into the dust, raised by those who succeeded him in the power three years after the state funeral of a hated and most honored leader. The stone is inhabited. In the spacey nostrils and auditory canals, in the creases of skin and uniform of the demolished monument, the poorer inhabitants of the capital are dwelling. During an appropriate period, the uprising follows the toppling of the monument. A drama, if it would still happen. It happened in the time of the uprising. The uprising starts with a stroll against the traffic rules during the working hours. The street belongs to the pedestrians. Here and there, a car is turned over. Nightmare of a knife thrower, slowly driving down a one-way street towards an irrevocable parking space surrounded by armed pedestrians. Policemen, if in the way, are swept to the curb. When the procession approaches the government district, it is stopped by a police line. People are in groups. Speakers arise from them. In the balcony of a government building, a man in badly fitting ears and begins to speak to. First stone hits him. He retreats behind the double doors of bulletproof glass. The call for more freedom turns into the cry for the overthrow of the government. People begin to disarm the policemen, to storm two, three buildings, a prison, a police precinct, an office of the secret police. They string up a dozen henchmen of the rulers by their heels. The government brings in troops, tanks. My place, if my drama would still happen, would be on both sides of the front, between the front lines, over and above them. I stand in the stench of the crowd and hurl stones at policemen, soldiers, tanks, bulletproof glass. Through the double doors, the crowd pressing forward and smell the sweat of my fear. Looking with nausea, I shake my fist at myself, who stands behind the bulletproof glass, shaking with fear and contempt. I see myself in the crowd, pressing forward, foaming at the mouth. I string up my uniformed flesh by my own heels. I am the soldier in the gun turret. My head is empty under the helmet, the stifled scream under the tracks. I am the typewriter. I tie the noose. When the ringleaders are strung up, I pull the stool from under their feet. I break my own neck. I am my own prisoner. I feed my own data into the computers. My parts are the spittle and the spittoon, the knife in the wound, the fang in the throat, the neck in the wound. From the databank, bleeding in the crowd, breathing again behind the double doors, oozing word slime, my soundproof blurb over and above the battle. My drama didn't happen. The script has been lost. The actors put their faces on the rack in the dressing room. In his box, the prompter is rotting. Stuffed corpses in the house don't stir a hand. I go home and kill the dog. Light itself. Television. The daily nausea, nausea of prefabricated battle, of decreed cheerfulness. How do you spell Gimlet's and Height? Give us this day our daily murder. Dying is nothingness, nausea, of the lies which are believed by the liars and nobody else. Nausea. Of the lies which are believed. Nausea. Of the mugs of the manipulators marked by their struggle for positions, votes, bank accounts. Nausea. A chariot armed with sights, sparkling with punchlines. I walk through the streets, stores, faces scarred by the consumer's battle. Poverty without dignity. Poverty without the dignity of the knife, the knuckle duster who clenched fist. The humiliated bodies of women, hope of generations, stifled in blood, cowardice, stupidity, laughter from dead bellies. Hail Coca-Cola, a kingdom for a murderer. I was in pain. The king had offered his third mistress to me. I knew every mole on her hips. Raskolnikov, close to the heart, under the only coat, the axe, for the only skull of the pawnbroker. In the solitude of the airports, I breathe again, I am a privileged person. My nausea is a Protected by torture, barbed wire prisons. I don't want to eat, drink, breathe, love a woman, a man, a child, an animal anymore. I don't want to die anymore. I don't want to kill anymore. I force open my sealed flesh. I want to dwell in my veins, in the marrow of my bones, in the bones of my skull. I retreat into my entrails. I take my seat in my shit. My blood. Somewhere, bodies are torn apart, striking blood. Somewhere bodies are open so I can be alone with my blood. My thoughts are lesions in my brain. My brain is a scar. I want to be a machine. 
arms for grabbing legs to walk on. No pain. The, the main point is, is to overthrow all existing, all existing conditions. conditions. Hamlet, the Dane prince and maggot's fodder, stumbling from hole to hole towards the final hole, listless in his back, the ghost that once made him green like Ophelia's flesh in childbed, and shortly ere the third cock's crow, a clown will tear the fool's cap off the philosopher, a bloated bloodhound will crawl into the armor. to the capitals of the world in the name of the victims. I eject all the sperm I received. I turn the milk of my breasts into lethal poison. With the happiness of submission, long live hate and contempt rebellion and death. If you walk through your bedrooms carrying butcher knives, you'll know the truth. Oh, in the space he nostrils and auditory canals too long, the creases of the skin and uniform of the demolished monument. Is Victor is Victoria here? Um, she should be. Um, I'm here. Is Suzanne here? Suzanne is on the chat, and I believe she is listening. Suzanne is a teacher. She currently um, is organizing an intentional community in the Bronx, and she's been teaching and studying and practicing ec ecstatic modalities for more than 20 years. I know her as a teacher and because I live in her community. She works with communication and with physical and emotional intelligences and with desire. I think desire would be her primary medium. When, when Suzanne said she was sick and Fiona asked if I, if I could fill in with her, I said, no, I really can't because so, many, so much of these practices, these practices that involve transformation or that get down to the self, and not the self as is conditioned to feel require a teacher you can't wake up alone and the mind can't transcend itself and i could give a lot of information as to like what happens or what she does but it's about the relationship that gets brought out i have some video clips of suzanne at the house so that you guys can get an idea of who she is and um how she enjoys herself because I think even though she has laryngitis right now and is sick, she's having a great time. <laughs> I guess it's just managing. Other person, other people um, are having a good time with my desire. Um, 
because like there's a certain level where you know people will go kicking and screaming and in the end it's really good for them and they'll maybe thank you for it or they'll just have a better life for it but there are other times when they're they're suffering too much they're suffering too much in the process so it stops being fun for them and for me and then i have to decide whether or not i can only try to get my desires in that particular way or in some other way because i can also open up to like other like miracles happening like i can be really clear that i want my desire to go this way but i open up to like enjoying some other new thing in the next moment then i don't have to be attached because that attachment can you know can make things like a little like too much friction yeah like where the pleasure comes is by relaxing and relaxing and relaxing and relaxing and then and like a being like open and an absorbing sensation and that's where intense orgasms come from but usually what happens in those you know like flogging or whatever is that people tense up and then they have they have a, a release but that's not the most intense way of having orgasm this out <laughs> yeah so we live in a house and we try and practice what we call responsible hedonism which is kind of redundant because if you're having a good time there's already a level of responsibility that goes into that we live in a pain-oriented society and it's so hard to like even even talking about sex under quarantine like it's so hard to talk about how much we are really getting off on having a ton of time to like talk and read and work and do things like this or have sex it all because we're so conditioned to be productive and so Suzanne's work is about getting down to true desire in a very in a very casual way in a very open way in the first video, she was talking about yeah, she's talking about how to get how to get what you want. Like normally, when we think about desire, we think about desire's object. Like we want this job, or we want this man, or we want like we as we saw on the red pill boards, like we want this marriage. But you can have all of you can get all of these things, but you can't really have them. Mm -hmm. And so, expanding your capacity to have these things requires transformation and and a lot of the times when we say we want something we really don't want it because it takes too much responsibility to have so one of the ways that we do one of the ways that we work with this at the house is we do work that has absolutely no political or personal motive behind it at all and right now we run a food charity where we pick up food we pick up food from whole foods i go down there at 7 a.m and on Sundays and get the food that they throw away, which is so much. Like we talk about a food scarcity right now, but there's really not. It's a, it's a problem in supply chains. And every week I go and see how much surplus there is, like how much goes to waste and how much there is available. And so my problems are like, how do, what do I do with 48 pounds of fruit? Like it's hard to get to the shelters. It's hard to distribute. And that's a, and that's a more fun problem to have like out of all the problems I could have, it's like, how do I, how do I not let all of this surplus go to waste? And that's one way to feel more deserving about the things we say we want. So if anybody wants to help with the food charity, I'm doing that every weekend, every weekend and throughout the week, because we could use the help and it feels, it feels really good to do. And there's a sense, there's a real sense of expansion that comes from it. But it, it also has to not mean anything to do it. Does it feel better than sex? I think that's the question, or at least mediocre sex. And well, that's, like, that's what I was thinking about a lot during all the presentations, not all of them, but a lot of the things that were discussed today. Like, I mean, looking at the red pill woman thing, like, is that, is that more, is, is that like view of sex more fun than solving like 
emergency supply chain things. Like, I don't know. It seems that that seems a lot more hellish. That's sort of been the space that I've been in the last couple of weeks. But anyways, I'll let you talk. Well, I, I think that's like the question, right? That's like the question. Because I think, you know, there are times in my life when I've had great sex, but haven't been able to enjoy it. Because I feel like I should be doing something else, or I feel like it is, it's a waste of time, or I don't deserve it. Like it always comes down to like, not feeling like I deserve it. And the ways that my brain will justify not deserving it. I know that um, when I was looking at the Marguerite Pratt, which the Mirror of Simple Souls, like basically what she's trying to say in it is the soul goes on this journey towards like the high love, like free souls and how sort of like the divine love that makes you like free. And it's kind of a freedom that's like more transcendent than like, oh, I am like this Lord and I own everything. Um, she says one of the ways to do that is to kind of go through uh, charity, so to speak, like this ultimate giving of the self without, or giving of oneself without anything necessarily in return, which is kind of like this ultimate love of the world and love of others and this kind of like full giving the way that like mystics will understand it is like better than sex. I don't know if it's like better or worse than sex, but I've definitely learned that I like to serve a lot better than I like to work. I was going to say, I think that there's like the charity aspect. I think that's one interesting aspect. And then the other aspect that at least I've been thinking about is like the, I guess, like self-efficacy hyper-competence level. I think like one part of the modern experience or whatever is feeling incompetent or feeling surrounded by incompetence. and when there's like a clear need and a clear way to fill it. I don't know, yeah, I don't think that maybe there's a erotic component to that, but there's like, at least like a very good like flow state component, sort of like an escape from feeling help, like like learned helplessness. I guess I'll go on my little rant about like almost wishing you could turn off the erotic for a while. Why isn't there a drug for that chemical castration thing? I know I've talked with you about that, Victoria, but I guess I could explore that here. For example, like people in, I think it's crazy that people in prison are given chemical concentration drugs, which are basically just birth control, and that that's not an option, or at least it's, it's considered only something you can be like really compelled in like a legal sense to do, or, or given or compelled at least in like a structural way. And for whatever reason, you know, we have plenty of drugs that uh, enhance your ability to have sex, or have, or, or feel, or, or be like erotically compelled to do things, or, 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 or but there's. It never, there's very few drugs, at least like on label treatments that are in a, that are towards like reduction in eroticism, at least even for short periods of time. Pippa Garner, who was supposed to join us and will have to join us for a later topic. She's like so well read and has so many ideas that she fits into every single topic we do. So it's not that much a worry, although we are worried about her health. But she talks about yeah, yeah, yeah. when she decided to transition in her 40s in the 80s with black market hormones it was in order to get rid of her like intense male sex drive which she found was like a tunnel vision and that was like one of the initial impetuses and so took estrogen and talks about like the she was like the edges blurring and like being able to see her peripheral vision for the first time how it transformed her consciousness and then like her art making I really wish Suzanne could speak because she teaches orgasmic meditation and I I think we live in a culture that's so, um, well, it's capital, like you have an orgasm, like you get a payoff, like there's like a build up, a build up and then a climax, like like a movie, like our narrative structures and our physiological structures obey that logic and because sexuality is so commercialized. Like, of course, they're not going to give us pills to reduce our libido because so much of the economy is based on capitalizing on that and capitalizing on these unresolved desires and this body anxiety and body tension. So Suzanne's work with orgasm is about 
making orgasm autonomous from sex. Like you don't need a relationship to have a great orgasm. Like you don't need, like you can have a relationship to orgasm like you have a relationship to yoga or to any other physical practice. And it's a lot, and it's easier. It's easier than, than changing the chemical state of your body because it's working with what's already there. It's a relationship with yourself more so than another person. Many um, women have a harder time because they're so self-conscious of receiving pleasure. Mara wanted to say something? Oh, um, it feels like old now. Um, But is anyone capable or has anyone had success in channeling any sort of like horniness into into a different energy like can you use that and not like have to manifest it sexually that's the big freud thing no right transforming libido Mm -hmm. into work he like advocated for work that was his idea about sublimation is that uh without achieving the aim and without repression you have the full quantity of pleasure So it's not fucking, nor do you repress some piece of your libido, but you get the full thing and you can drag it out over time. So it's not immediate, which is what work requires. Mm -hmm. But he said that that only a few people can do it. Can anyone here do that? (laughs) I think the way that society, especially I think for men, works, like manages to transmute like sexual desire into like work or productivity is like via status. You, you, you use like the motivation for sex as a way to like, or really maybe probably even more just like a relationship is like a way to motivate yourself to work or like society almost kind of makes this like builds this circuit for you. But I think I've, I've, I, I, I work best and can concentrate best when I'm really sexually frustrated. It gives me like a certain a certain energy and a certain focus that I don't have if I'm having sex. Because if I'm having a lot of sex, I'm very, very relaxed and possibly too relaxed. But if I'm really pent up and if there's someone that I really want to fuck as well that's out of reach, that makes me focus even more. Probably depends because I on just the feel like totally focused. It depends a lot on the work. But I, I think I'm, I was talking, I'm thinking especially in this context now of like it's in some ways literally... Uh, at least maybe not impossible, but a bad idea to go have like actual physical sex with somebody. I think we have two totally opposite ideas here. We have sexuality tied to fear and anxiety and destruction and dissolution and frustration. And then we have this other sexuality as relaxation and ease and Mm -hmm. giving... So I don't know. There, there seem to be on very opposite poles. Yeah. I just wanted to ask Mara, just what you're thinking about the kind of like translation of horniness into other kind of or frustrations into other kinds of activity. Well, I mean, it was selfish, I guess. Like, I have a lot of pent up energy. I'm trying to figure out how I turn it into something else. Well, I guess I'm I'm saying I have similar questions. You know, I'm just, I'm I have similar questions, and just you know, I'm kind of like okay, like now I'm like living in this world like that lacks the kind of sensations that I'm used to. So I think I'm feeling kind of what you're talking about. Right. Yeah. I mean, I think in a way, like I sort of I like the idea of not actually doing anything with it and really like feeling like because there is this weird, you know, turning it into something else is like is that escapist or is that trying to place myself in a mode of productivity and like why does that need to be the standard do you um, want to be productive oh yeah sure That's a desire. I'm, I'm like really not right now um please but and like i think uh... people someone used to encourage me to um masturbate to specific intentions specific types of masturbation maybe not just like vibratory like quick but like a concentrated focus kind of session with um, trying to picture goals of various sorts whether they were like healing or like this project and somehow to like time your orgasm with your brain repeating like my novel my novel my novel my novel and that somehow that would like um, create an energy field and 
I knew someone who do, would do that as like a healing gesture for others. So she knew someone who had cancer and she would like dedicate her orgasms to this friend and be like, I'm sending all of this like power. Or you could do it selfishly to your own productive needs or something. That might be fun. But usually it happens to me. Like I can't decide when. And oh, interesting. Like it's like, like when it's like coming or something. Like you don't get, I mean, I don't get to decide sometimes. Like it just happens. Mm -mm -mm. Yeah. yeah, when it can be used in another way, it just kind of ends up happening. Can something be called masturbatory if it's productive? Yeah. <laughs> I think we're so we're just so obsessed. Yeah. I think I think doing something for the enjoyment or pleasure of it is just so um, like we can't wrap our minds around it. And I think it's very hard for to let, like we have to justify pleasure for some reason. I, don't, I agree. I, might, I don't. I think that pleasure might be a, either a thing or a process that eludes justification. I, in terms of fantasies, um, I've never had more of a desire to have an orgy in my life as I have with social distancing. <laughs> Well, thank you. Um, people are welcome to hang out more. Yeah. 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 I say hi to all the yeah. audience, Christopher and Jackie and Tori yeah. and Carmen, yeah. Patrick, who you heard from, yeah. Matt, Kenny, yeah. oh yeah, in the corner. Um, Hello, goodbye. Look forward to courtroom dramas. Hi, thank you. I'll talk to you. Bye. Matt, your things are freaking out. Yeah. Maybe I'll stay to the room. <laughs>